Hello, everyone, and welcome to Prioritizing Equity. I'm Aletha Maybank, and I'm Senior Vice President and the Chief Health Equity Officer at the American Medical Association. Thank you for joining us for a new episode of Prioritizing Equity. Uh, today, death by firearms is the leading cause of death uh, in children in the United States. And we know in public health that this is preventable and just really should not be. Uh, we see more health systems and physicians um, within them taking action with advocacy in its many forms, and as well as doing program development and implementation. Uh, here at AMA, we have strengthened our efforts for preventing gun violence. Specifically, we have committed to form a gun violence prevention task force, as well as adopted over 30 policy recommendations to reduce firearm violence, trauma, injury, and death. And some of these policies include AMA supporting gun research, regulating ghost guns, and advocating for warning labels on ammunition packages. But today's conversation really builds upon our other sessions related to gun violence as a public health issue. And we'll hear from physicians who are leading narrative change efforts in medicine and across the country, really overall, that embrace frameworks and methods of public safety and public health, as well as, as, well as leading gun violence prevention within their own institutions. I'll say on a more personal note, this conversation is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I've spent a good part of my career advocating funding and working with neighborhoods in New York City, overseeing gun violence prevention programs and implementing them on a place-based level. And what's always was clear to me is that the leaders in our neighborhoods, really they have the brilliant ideas and solutions um, to making their communities safe places. However, there was and there still is really a resistance to embracing and understanding this other opportunity that frames the context of what they're experiencing um, into public safety and public health, and then the actions that really take to embody that and that would work to support these leaders at a local level. So today's session, we're gonna hear from uh, four physicians who are working at this intersection of public health, public safety, um, and therefore to meet uh, justice and gun violence. Um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Megan Ranny, uh, who is emergency physician, who is con currently the deputy dean at the Brown, uh, at Brown, sorry, my, my screen says at the Brown. Um, she is <laughs> the incoming dean at the Yale School of Public Health, and um, who has been with us before, and I really want to thank you for coming and spending some time again. Dr. Eric Reinhardt, who is a political anthropologist of law and public health, a psychoanalyst, and a second year psychiatry resident at Northwestern. Uh, Dr. Joe Sakrin, uh, who is uh, Vice Chair in Clinical Operations um, of Surgery at Johns Hopkins Medicine, and Dr. Brian Williams, who is a trauma and acute care surgeon in Dallas, Texas. Really honored um, for all of you to be here, um, your brilliant minds and all of that. And I'm first, you know, I, if you've ever seen these episodes, I really just go around and ask how y'all are doing um, in general, um, and where are you um, at this point in time in the country? So I will start, I'm gonna start with um, Megan, go ahead. Um, around In general, I'm doing well, uh, but on this issue in particular, I think uh, we're at, um, as has so often happened before over the last decades, um, we're at yet another inflection point. Um, you know, we're recording this about a week after the Nashville shooting. Um, and, you know, goodness knows how many other shootings um, over the last week that got less media publicity and I think I was really actually looking forward to this podcast as a chance to recenter us um, around both the urgency of working on this issue, but also the hope. Um, I think it's far too easy to become numb and hopeless in the face of these continued um, publicized mass shootings. Again, never mind the, the daily toll um, that we hear less about in the news, but that we certainly encounter in clinical practice. Absolutely. Thank you, Joe. How are you? Where are you? Yeah, well, look, I'm in Baltimore, Maryland right now. I was on call the past uh, 24 hours. So I guess I'm, I'm doing okay. What a great time to have a conversation because, you know, post-call, you're a little bit frontal and you're just going to speak your mind, which is what I try to do anyways. And um, look, I'm really grateful to be part of this incredible panel. And I'm glad that, you know, the AMA and so many of our medical organizations have really um, taken this issue you know, front and center. And I can't think of a more important group than healthcare professionals who are, frankly, at the center of this issue, having to talk to families and take care of patients to be part of the solution in what is perhaps the most uh, important 
uh, public health problem of modern times. So thank you for doing this, and I look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Brian? Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, to be quite honest, I'm at a little bit of a... Uh, I, don't, I don't know how to describe how I feel right now, and the reason is this conversation is timely because my cousin was shot and killed last week oh, and came to the funeral this yeah. weekend. Uh, I actually almost did not come to the, the the recording today because of that. But then I thought, you know, I wanted to bring a voice that is not just a professional uh, endeavor for me to reduce gun violence, but also this is personal. It's infected my family uh, more than just once, uh, but as recently as this last week. So the timeliness of it kind of brought me back to this discussion today to talk about the human poll that happens every day that is not making the news, but also that we as healthcare providers are also humans, and this impacts us beyond just a professional endeavor. Absolutely. Well, tremendous, like, sorry for your loss, Brian. Um, and thank you for making the time to speak with us and, and very timely. And I think you bring up um, the, the point that folks don't always get that this work is about us. You know, we're, we're fighting for our own lives and for our own families all the time. Uh, we're not disconnected from it at all. So I appreciate you being here. Uh, Eric? Yeah. Thank you for coming, Brian. Um, yeah, I've been working on issues related to this and in communities really affected by gun violence for about 15 years in Chicago. And most of that time, I've not been feeling a lot of hope. Mariam Kava says that hope is a discipline. And I found it a really, really difficult discipline to maintain over time. Um, but right now it feels different to me, at least in Chicago, because we just had a big electoral shift um, with Brandon Johnson coming into office. And the big crux of the, the race here was between a public health model of public safety, which communities have not really had an opportunity to see work, we've not seen investment in it before. And then on the other hand, with Paul Vallis, there was more of an investment in a, in a continuation of the current police model. So to see the public health model that all of us here have been working to support for so long finally have a chance to maybe do, to maybe be demonstrate, demonstrated in a place that really, really needs it has brought me hope. So I'm finding hope a lot more, um, a lot easier to maintain right now than in, under ordinary circumstances. Thanks, Eric, and I appreciate it. And that kind of, it leads me to one of, you know, the early questions. And I think there are a lot of assumptions and I, for somebody, I've spent so much time in public health, um, that has been most of my career in governmental public health, kind of transitioning over to AMA and the healthcare side. You know, I fully kind of uh, appreciate the gap in understanding and knowledge about even what is, what is public health and what is public safety like as a frame. And Eric, you've written several pieces on this. So I'd love you know, if you could kind of start and describe that as a basic, because this is an educational tool for um, health professionals. So if you could just describe those distinctions, it'd be awesome. Yeah. I mean, not only is a public health approach to public safety not widely understood right now, even among healthcare professionals, but just public health as a framework is not widely understood. Public health as a field in the U.S. has over the last at least 50 years been largely taken over by biomedical frameworks and has abandoned many of its foundational principles, which you find now more in the field of social medicine and within schools of public health, but not always. Often you see there, again, a perpetuation of more biomedical ideas. These, you know, you could separate the distinction between these two in this way. The biomedicine is largely organized around treatment. It's largely organized around clinical mentalities, responding to the individual patient in front of you, and perhaps some of the marginal social connections that are implicated but it is not generally oriented around root cause analysis, root cause policy responses, political struggle to address the fundamental drivers of poor health, of, uh, of poor safety in our communities. This is the public health framework. It understands that health is fundamentally political. It's shaped by policy. That's what that means. That's a, even just that term, the idea that something is political is widely misunderstood in the US and that we cannot build health, we cannot build safety to fundamentally intertwine things unless we address root causes. And we have to do that through policy action. Research, descriptive research is not enough. Um, 
So this, this would be one of the beginning distinctions to be made. And then with public safety and public health, what you've had in the US is a field of public safety that's really been dominated by criminological metrics and criminological terms. The field of criminology, a branch of sociology, has developed in very, very close association with police departments and policing systems in general for about 100 years. And what that has resulted in is a way of measuring safety that is fixated on only one part of safety, which is crime rates. That is the generally accepted uh, metric upon which we evaluate public safety in our communities. What's left out then are eviction rates, maternal mortality rates, overdose rates, uh, poverty rates, uh, access to health care and mental health care. Uh, all of these things that are arguably, not arguably, I think it's quite clear, statistically are the much bigger drivers of the lack of safety in our communities. So public health as it approaches public safety, I think the task is to reclaim not just the interventions, but also the way that we measure, the way that we conceptualize safety to approach it with a much more holistic root cause oriented framework. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate that very much. Um, very good and very clear. Megan, and kind of, you know, building off of that, then how, like what's the frame in and how do you bring in gun violence to that context? And especially now you're headed to a public health school and one of the leading ones in the country, congratulations on that. You know, what does that mean um, in terms of the context of gun violence and gun violence prevention? Absolutely, uh, thank you for having us on. And Eric, thanks for that framing. I think I think about public health in ways that are similar to Eric's, but slightly different. So to me, the, the public health framework really is this four-step approach. Um, that we take to any health problem, which is about collecting data, looking at risk and preventive factors. And there are a bunch of different models that we can use for looking at risk and preventive factors, one of which is this kind of uh, root cause analysis. There's the social ecological model that goes from individual out to society. And then within the world of injury prevention, we talk about there being um, kind of different types of risk and prevention uh, frameworks as well. The third step in the public health model is looking at what can we do to change it. Again, that's going to be interventions or uh, programs that could range from something on the individual level. We can talk as we go on in the podcast about some uh, hospital-based programs that many of us are involved in, up through the neighborhood or community, uh, up through society. And those can range from policies and legislation to culture change or environmental change and investment uh, shifts in the educational system. There's a wide variety of types of interventions that are part of the public health framework. And then that last step is we put in place what works. All of us as physicians uh, have been part of shifts in evidence in our clinical practice. And we've seen the same thing in public health where it is critically important for us to evaluate whether or not a strategy actually works to decrease the burden of injury, the burden of disease um, writ large, rather than just putting in place what we think might work based off of an emotional gut reaction. Um, and to me, that's where we straddling medicine and public health both have the capacity to raise awareness to those very real health effects of firearm injury, calling out that this is a health problem. And to go off of what Eric said, this is not simply a criminological or political or policy problem. It is something that affects people's physical and emotional health, their sense of safety, their sense of well-being, their ability to go out uh, on the streets, to go to school, to go to work, and then use that four-part strategy to develop a wide spectrum of interventions because there is no public health problem in history that has been solved through a single strategy. And so to me, the advantage of bringing it into that health sphere is that it gives us a whole new language and a whole new suite of potential interventions that we can bring to bear, again, rather than being uh, hopeless and helpless. Thanks, Megan. Joe, do you have any further reflection on the comments? Yeah, I mean, listen, I'm not gonna repeat what, yeah, I'm not gonna repeat what, you know, that was an incredible, I think, framing of, of what a public health problem is. And I think in my mind, I try to think about it in a very simple way, right? Which is, you know, our goal is to improve the health and well-being of the population as a whole, right? Rather than just treating the individual patients. And when I think about other public health problems that we have faced, that we have to recognize that there is no one solution, right? This requires a multifaceted approach that cuts across different 
disciplines. And the one thing that I'll just I'll say is, you know, we have to move away from simply trying to uh, focus on human behavior, which we know in and of itself is not cost effective, and really developing a system that allows us to ensure that we can make communities safer. And that's what we've been trying to do. We have seen a cultural transformation over the past decade because of the work that's being done at the local and the state level that has allowed us to come to the point where people, right, even outside of healthcare, are now talking about this issue as a public health problem and not simply from the vantage point of a criminal justice issue. And I think that's so critical. Thanks, Joe. And Brian? I, I, I love hearing Eric talk. Uh, we talked about this before and the way he approaches this uh, is, is very inspiring. But when he talked about the root causes and addressing those to reduce the, 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 the human toll of gun violence, that is something I think is very important. And speaking specifically to the medical students and trainees who may be mm -hmm. watching this, the first time I heard about public health, I was midway through my residency. Mm -hmm. We're having a discussion and I said, what is public health? And that's that's absurd, right? That I've got that far in my medical education without really focusing on public or what public health meant. I think that's changed now for the newer generation, but I think that will make uh, the, the profession and this upcoming generation of healthcare uh, uh, professionals much more effective at eradicating root causes of these huge problems that seem insur insurmountable. So I like that we're having this discussion about public health and actually bridging it and making it more interlocked with what medical or traditional medical training. I think it'll go far towards reducing the human toll of gun violence. Absolutely. Um, and again, y'all are, I, I open the floor up always for you all to ask questions and to, to chime in. So don't, don't mind me. I'm just here for the flow. <laughs> um, so thanks for that. And actually, Brian, just to go to you and just speak specifically, um, kind of connecting those dots, you know, practically, in the spaces that you have been, you were you were in Chicago and now you're in Dallas. You know, but can you talk about how you have, you know, worked to support building in that public health frame in the efforts that you're doing, kind of within the context of the institution around gun violence prevention um, for the residents, students, or even faculty staff, right? It's not we're educating everyone, right? It, a, a lot of times in the context of our the institutions that we're working in. Sure. This is the great thing about academia is that we're, we are constant learners. So I remember my first gun violence victim when I was a medical student down in Tampa, uh, then more gun violence in Boston as a resident, then in Atlanta as a fellow, Dallas, Chicago, now back to Dallas. What I've seen over the time period for me, my personal evolution is I had to look beyond just the one-on-one -on -one interaction with these victims that were coming in because there was something more profound happening outside of the hospital that was putting them at risk. And how do I connect those dots so that those of us that are caring for these patients, the doctors and the nurses and the techs can be more effective at influencing action outside of the hospital. And I think you touched upon this, very important. You, you mentioned that the community leaders have really good uh, solutions. And often the people closest to the problem have the best solutions. So we, within the hospital, caring for these patients and taking care of their families, need to do a better job of connecting with those closest to the problem. And you see that happening a lot more uh, at institutions across the country. So my part has been is how do I educate my residents and students and fellows? And I say my, they don't belong to me, but you know I feel very protective of them uh, yeah. as, a, as a, a faculty member. But how do we infuse that experience, that lens, so they look at this beyond just a gunshot victim. They are a human being, an entire story that impacts their lives. How can we affect that to make their lives better? Dr. Maybank, if I can just build off of that real quick, because yeah. I, I think I think what uh, my man Brian is saying here is so critical, and 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 this often gets lost, whether it's an incredible medical organization like AMA or me sitting here at Johns Hopkins. Um, we often forget the fact that the community, right, those that are closest to the struggle understand what the solutions are. And we have to really, and I think we've started to do this, shift our strategy and approach 
from simply like, you know, trying to come up with solutions, say, hey, this is what you should implement, and actually engaging the community, those that are living this every day, to be true partners in the process of developing these very critical processes that are going to allow us to make uh, community safer. And, and it's very easy to forget that. So we've really been, I think, very deliberate about making sure that the right people are at the table. And then the last just kind of piece of this is when you think about healthcare professionals, it's it's not natural, I think, in traditional training for us to think about our impact beyond the bedside. And what I would say is when you look at the social issues that we are facing in America today, whether it is gun violence or COVID or climate change, immigration, racism, health inequities, right? They're so interconnected to health. And we have both the opportunity and the responsibility to help drive that change. But that's not traditionally taught. And that's why right now we're seeing health systems really think about how do we empower our healthcare workers, our professionals, to be able to be part of that community as trusted public messengers. And that's so important. And Joe, if I can go off of that, just to kind of go back to something that Eric said at the beginning, which is to also avoid medicalizing this, that although, yes, physicians and nurses have a critical voice in the fight against firearm injury, whether it's homicide, suicide, unintentional injury, we cannot center this fight around ourselves. I think that there is a special power that comes when we come to the table, when we have our wear our white coats, when we tell the stories, um, either personal or HIPAA appropriate um, stories of, of patient care. Um, and we saw that with our the This Is Our Lane campaign um, back in uh, a few years back in 2018. But, and um, to never forget that a true public health solution and really the way that we are going to fix this issue cannot be centered on us and what we encounter in the hospital. By the time someone comes to us, we have missed so many opportunities for upstream prevention. It's not, yes, it's about separating someone from the um, potential to access a firearm at that moment of desperation, anger, impulsivity, hopelessness. It is also, though, about changing all of those steps that put someone in harm's way up until that kind of final moment of being ready to pull the trigger. Um, and, and I think that we just, you know, we miss the, the forest for the trees when we only focus on kind of what happens after someone has been shot. Absolutely. Eric, I'm, gonna, I'm coming to you, Eric. I, pro I am right now. You're, you're next. <laughs> uh, thank you. And, we're, and I want you to build on that. And I also, but I also want you to talk from the perspective of being a current resident, but also I, we, Eric and I have had a lot of conversations and I know, I know a lot of how Eric is rooted and it's very aligned with me. And I just speaking to kind of that role of the physician um, and the ideas of like what is needed. And we talk a lot about revolutionary medicine and things of that nature. So I want you to kind of speak to that of what is really needed in yeah. order to, to drive this, this change of how we think and operate and, and not the literal operate, but maybe the literal operate. I don't know. I'm not a surgeon, but like how we function, you know, as, as medicine. Yeah. I, I, so everything that each person has said so far, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about hearing this. Um, and, you know, everyone here, I look up to enormously and you're each far more advanced professionally than I am. So your question, Aletha, I think is quite useful to think about from a training perspective, from an institutional perspective, when you are looking to climb a hierarchy, most of the people with whom I train, they're, they're planning to get jobs afterwards. And they're hoping some of them, at least that they're academic jobs. And in order to get those jobs, you have to abide by certain norms. You have to meet certain expectations. Nobody that I work with says, we're gonna go medicalize political problems and end up causing unintended harm. Nobody is setting out to do that. But there are institutional structures that reproduce that harm and that medicalizing tendency time and time again. So I think, you know, I used to teach a course with, with Paul Farmer, Arthur Clement, Salman Khatavi, some other people, and we, we would focus one of our main frameworks for thinking about global public health is thinking about the unintended consequences of purposive social action we set out to do good and we end up abetting the perpetuation of the status quo, the deepening of inequalities and the medical apparatus in the US has done this so many times. And it's not through lack of good intent. It's in part because of the institutional normativities that are pressed upon us and we absorb without recognizing it. So I think going through training within a medical apparatus, uh, 
I, I realize I'm using this term. This is in talk for, part from Foucault. He has this term dispositif, this idea of a, of a social apparatus that embeds all of these norms inside us and that we end up reproducing without recognizing it. This is for, for Foucault power. Power is not acted upon us, it's acted through us. And this is absolutely true of medical training. So I think it's really important to ground oneself in communities, in ways of thinking, in mentalities, epistemic structures, ways of knowing that are outside of these powerful medical institutions, which are oriented around research grants. So NIH, NIH metrics and values, um, the bottom lines of the institutions for which we work, you know, tenure lines and all the politics that go into that. These are not things that serve our communities. They may be hurdles that we have to get over in order to be in positions to leverage institutional power for some other purpose. But that is a very difficult process. And most people are absorbed into the norms of these institutions, which are not aligned with the goals of our of the communities that we say we serve. So I think this is a very difficult problem to confront as a trainee. How do you ground yourself in ways of knowing the world, of valuing things that are not the cost benefit analyses of economists, but the cost benefit analyses of people who are living through the everyday texture of violence and loss and grief. And that's not easily put into a number and spit out in a paper for JAMA. But that's, I think, where we need to, to ground ourselves if we're to be faithful to the ideals with which we enter. So that was maybe a very abstract response to your question, Alita, but I think it's a it's a huge question. It's everybody's showing up as their true selves. That's what I want. So <laughs> no, it's a beautiful response to the question. I appreciate it. Um, you know, so, and I'm, I'm not gonna completely switch because I think um, I'm hoping we provided those who are listening in um, kind of, again, the concepts, definitions, um, ways of thinking, narrative change, um, our role as physicians. And so I wanna to speak to now kind of the context of policy and advocacy, um, because I think we all are very clear that that's really important within our institutions, yeah. And then also, you know, big P outside. And so Joe, you know, you've led lots of advocacy and I would love for you to kind of just speak to um, what that looks like, you know, at this point in time within your institution, but also how have you been operating externally um, with partners and, and what's really needed at this time from physicians and other health professionals as well? Yeah, so uh, look, you know, I think um, health professionals have such an important role to play in advocating for gun violence prevention. And I think there's, when I look at this, really, um, I'm blessed to be at an institution that really is supportive of the work that I'm doing both locally uh, and across the country. And I, and as we heard earlier, that's not always the case. I think there's several things that health professionals can really do to really think about this, both within the system and beyond. The first is within the health system, I think as health professionals, we can raise awareness of the impact of gun violence on public health, which we've talked about, right? educating our colleagues, patients, and the community members about the risks associated with firearms and the importance of gun safety. I think health professionals can also advocate for data-driven policy changes, right, that can reduce um, gun violence. And we've talked about this in so many different forums. Most recently, uh, as you know, Dr. Maybank, the American College of Surgeons with a number of other um, organizations, including the AMA, came together and brought together 46 different uh, medical organizations across the country to really be able to look at this issue as kind of the house of medicine, which is which is tremendous, right? And for the first time, we are hearing health professionals talk about supporting data-driven policy measures, which I can tell you, when you look back a couple of years ago, when we had the first summit, as Dr. Rainey will remember, um, no one wanted to talk about policy at the time. So there's really a, a transformation happening. Outside of our health system, um, I think that health professionals can engage in community-based advocacy efforts, right? Uh, there are many organizations, in full disclosure, I'm a board member uh, of Brady United, and I work a lot with Brady United, but also other organizations that are working in the space, because what has happened is we have seen these silos that exist across cities and states, which has really been detrimental to moving the needle forward. And one of the things that we're trying to do is really break down those silos so we can work hand to hand uh, in parallel. And then the last thing that I'll say is I think health professionals like so many people on this call have engaged in research to better understand the causes and consequences of gun violence in America. And this includes conducting studies on effectiveness of different prevention strategies, as well as identifying risk factors for, for gun violence. So overall, we have a critical role to play. Thank you. Um, Megan, as you start to 
you know, think about your role. What's your vision on, you know, educating? Clearly, they're going to be public health students. Some may not be, you know, physicians, um, which is fine, clearly, but we want more physicians to have public health degrees, of course, or to have that context. Um, you know, what's your vision of, of, of how to educate the, the public health student of the future? And what's the process that you'll go through to kind of figure out what is best? Because Eric, you, you heard from a trainee here. Eric yeah. provided some context, right? And I think that that's important of centering the voices of those who are kind of experiencing training now and getting their ideas. But I would just love to hear from you how you plan to lead um, around this issue. Yeah. yeah. So I think kind of the most important thing and the grounding of public health, as the other three have already outlined, is really that basis in the public and in the community. And so if as I'm thinking about doing work around firearm injury prevention, within the Yale School of Public Health, you know, in conjunction with the law school and the School of Medicine and the School of Architecture, right? There's a there's absolutely an element of the built environment and of housing. Um, a, the foundation of all of that is grounding it in the community experience. Um, the next step is understanding theory. And you do have to understand theories of behavior change, whether it's on an individual level or on a societal level. There's no need to recreate the wheel when there are strategies that have already worked for similar problems in the past. And then the third part is working in partnership to apply it and giving folks the actual opportunity to make that difference, to create change and to see the uh, positive effects of the process. And I'll say in my work with trainees, and I've been quite fortunate to have a number of both residents, fellows, master students, doctoral students. Um, we have a current uh, brand new faculty member who uh, used to be a police chief um, and is now a, a faculty focusing on substance use disorder and the overlap um, with the justice system just published a marvelous paper in JAMA of all places uh, showing that the amount of violence um, that youth are exposed to in urban neighborhoods uh, far uh, outstrips the amount of violence um, that people are exposed to in the military. And so kind of providing those opportunities where trainees have a chance to say, this is an issue that matters. I'm going to get to know the community. I am going to develop a skill set to be able to adequately describe and analyze it as Joe outlined. And then I'm going to do something. I'm going to use my own personal experience as well as my uh, passion to help make a difference. Um, and there are and a thousand ways that we need to do that work to make a difference. And I'm looking forward to bringing it to Yale, but it's also about like the bigger picture. It's not about one institution. Um, it's about us working with Southern Connecticut University and working uh, in Hartford and in Bridgeport as well. So there's a there's a much bigger picture than, than any one institution. Absolutely. And I also think um, I, I appreciate that and the context of you know, a political education also um, mm -hmm. oftentimes gets missed in, in even a public health education. Um, and, you know, we have a, a fellowship and I usually don't do this in, in this conversation, but I'm going to do it in this one. We have a, a medical justice advocacy fellowship where we have 12 um, kind of mid, mid to early career physicians um, who spend a year with us. And they say, you know, the most impactful part has been them actually going to the Hill and learning yeah. firsthand what it means to actually speak to a politician. And then it gets them the better sense of how they have to show up and what's important and relevant, but also how to tell the story that's relevant. And I think oftentimes, and I think Joe, you've said this, Eric, you're kind of saying that you all have said this, you know, we, we have to know how to kind of show up in those spaces too, um, in order to be effective as physicians and advocates. And I think the more that we have that kind of education, the more helpful it is for us um, and as individuals, but also as the collective, we start to kind of have an analysis that um, is shared in common. Um, and I feel that kind of, it, it feels more healing. And so as I talk about healing, um, Dr. Williams, Brian, you have a new book, um, The Bodies Keep Coming, Dispatches from a Black Trauma Surgeon on Racism, Violence, and How We Heal. And congratulations on that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about like why you wrote this? Uh, and then I'm going to ask the question of you about, you know, how do we heal? And I want everyone to then answer that as well. Sure. I, I wrote this book because I wanted to be part of the solution to all the social injustices that I think we witness, uh, particularly in trauma and emergency medicine throughout healthcare. 
and move beyond the hospital and expand the 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 group of people involved in the solutions, right? Not just those that work within in healthcare. So I wanted the goal was to reframe the narrative about structural racism and healthcare inequity and what it makes what it means to create justice today, not just talk about it or write about it or go to conferences. What work do we need to do to make that happen uh, today? So I, I began this book, and the entry point is basically me as a trauma surgeon, but I wanted to explore the bigger issues that we're dealing with nowadays. Structural racism, uh, economic disenfranchisement, education issues, how those all come together. Because as Joe said earlier, these are all interconnected to health, right? These all cross our paths and impact our, our jobs and our roles. So I felt, okay, let me bring you into this world that I'm in. Like, how can I pull you in and show you the world through my eyes and then go on this journey and say, here's what's happening here in the hospital. Here's what's happening outside the hospital where you are now. How do we come together to create justice and move towards healing? Because in the end, the most important part of this book, I feel, is it is hopeful. It's not an easy read, but in the end, it's meant to be hopeful and to show how we can come together to create a better future. Thank you. And how do you, I just ask you another question. Do you feel you changed in the process of writing this book? Like what, you know, what, how are you, you know, after writing this? Um, Cause I think that I also, you know, speak to the power of us as physicians and the possibility really for us to kind of put our voices in places um, such as books and publications, I think is tremendous. And all of you engage um, in writing. And I think from my experience, you know, I've recognized um, there's a change in me after I, every time I write something, um, cause you go through a process. So I'm just curious about, did you, did you change in any way? Did you learn anything about yourself as you went through the process? I'll say the answer to both of those questions is yes, in all caps. Uh, <laughs> they say that writing a book may not change your life, but it will certainly change you. And that's true for this. It's, it is, it's a memoir. So it's, I'm telling personal stories it is rooted in personal narrative. So to, you know, to share those things with strangers, you know, that, that, that will change you to think about what you're going to share, uh, recognizing that you are putting yourself out there for praise, but also critique, you have to prepare for that. Um, but in the end, it was, it was very, very uh, useful, important for me to do that because in doing so, it really forced me to think about the world around me and the role I wanted to play in making the world a better place. Uh, you know, I could be a great clinician, an educator, a research, do all those things, but really what is it that I can do to make the world around me on a large population level a, a better place? And writing the book kind of forced me to, uh, to articulate that and internalize that going forward. So yes, I'm different than I was when you first asked me to do this, this podcast. <laughs> I've, I've yeah. changed that much. Yeah, yeah. Um, the others, uh, you know, how do, how how do we heal? What are the, what do we have to do to heal as I think individuals and communities, society? Um, I'll go with Joe. Joe, we'll go with you first. We'll go start there. Yeah. Well, look. Um, I, here's what I'll say: is I don't think there is any one right answer. You know, when you think about healing and you think about grief, I think each and every one of us we deal with it in in very different ways. And look, I come to this conversation, you know, not just as a trauma surgeon, but as a survivor of gun violence. And I think about, you know, my ability to do, you know, my job today and, and how am I able to do that? Well, I think part of it was there, you know, it's been, you know, quite a while. You know, I was 17 when I was shot in the throat to, you know, getting to this point where there was enough time where I was able to process the trauma that happened. And I think a lot of times, you know, when you think about what we do as those of us that care for injured patients, where we're making, you know, one methodical decision after the other, and we've often forgotten the kind of mental and emotional impact that has on us as a team. And right now we are starting to kind of peel back those layers. So some people on our team, you know, the way they heal is they talk about it. But some people, they need time before they can, you know, get it out. And so there's all sorts of different ways that I think um, have to be tailored to, you know, the individual. Uh, and I don't think there's any necessarily one right answer, if that makes sense. 
Oh, absolutely. There's definitely not one one right yeah. answer. Um, thank you, Megan. Uh, I believe that we heal, but also create hope by doing the work to change the structures that got us into this place. Um, at the end of the day, that is what creates hope. It's that sense of community and purpose and a sense of honestly control and action. Um, and so I think that the biggest thing that any of us on this podcast, anyone listening to it um, can do is to commit to being part of the change. Um, I, I couldn't agree more with Joe's statement about each of us is going to find that path in a different way. For some, it may be through our faith community. For some, it may be through uh, kind of a, a sporting community or um, through a cultural group um, or through a specialty society or through um, an organization like the AMA. Um, but finding those groups of people, and I will say um, some of the folks on this podcast have been part of that hope and healing for me. Um, having that ability to lift each other up as we go forwards um, and, and make clear that there is a path is, is truly the, the only way. Thanks, Megan. Eric? Yeah, Brian said, as he was describing his book, that one of the motivating questions is how do we come together to heal? And for me, this is absolutely central. Care, in my view, healing, they are fundamentally participatory. They are collective activities. We have this imagination often of ourselves as clinicians, as people who go and care for other people. And this is a pervasive idea of what caring is, a kind of unidirectional relationship, a kind of charitable humanitarian enterprise. This, I think, is really corrosive to the possibility of truly effective care within society where I care for somebody else and they are simultaneously caring for me and caring for others. I think one of the most important parts of healing is finding a way, being given a way, a role, a valued, dignified role to care for others, to be part of a collective process in which the whole of society, the whole of a population is working upon itself and everybody has a role. I think of this in part through what I've been formulating in my head as a kind of idea of disability collectivity, that everybody, has some kind of disability or another. That doesn't mean they're the same. We all have very different positions from which to act. But with every disability also comes a kind of corresponding insight and ability, a way to relate to people in a different kind of way. What would a society look like that's organized not around caring charitably for those who are disabled, who are sick, but for finding out and maximizing the potential of each person to participate in a process of collective care with one another. To me, this is healing. And this is not just an abstract ethical idea. To me, this is very much a political idea. This is a poly policy question. How do we build health systems, not necessarily health care systems, but health systems that are grounded in the search for producing the community structures that are well-funded, not just saying, I value your lived experience, but backing that with material investment and employment to participate in this kind of a care structure. So for me, healing is about this kind of political work to produce the possibility of collective healing and participatory care. Thanks, Eric. Um, I'm, you know, we're, we're towards the end. I could really continue on because I really have a lot of other questions for y'all, but um, we're, we're 45 minutes. Um, and I just, I really want to thank all of you. Um, you know, I, I see you, I follow you. Um, and just again, thank you for, you know, the leadership that you have shown this country um, and our profession um, and yourselves, really. Um, I, you can see towards the end of the show and kind of where I am and how I've evolved over my career is I can talk about the technicalities of a lot of this work for sure, but I don't feel that that's where the human spirit is moved to do differently and to be better. And it happens at the intersection of hearing each other's stories, being able to show up as our full selves, so that we can connect with one another. And as Eric said, value the dignity in, in each of us. Um, and so that's, I, I'm, thank you for allowing the space to get to that point. Um, and I really appreciate you all um, for that. Thank you all for, for listening in um, for today and the panelists. Um, in closing, I do wanna just acknowledge and highlight, um, we have a, an initiative called Rise to Health, which is a national coalition for equity in healthcare. Again, kind of building on the same principles that you know, we're talking about today, about what does it really mean to have collective care and to be in coalition with one another. Um, for more information, you can go to uh, www.risetohealth.org. Um, and also we launched National Health Equity Ground Rounds. Uh, we had a exciting session, the first one. The next one is on May 9th called Follow the Money. 
understanding the structural incentives for inequity in healthcare and beyond. I don't think we've announced who's going to be on that conversation, but uh, it's, it's kind of good. Uh, so I hope you all are going to be able to uh, tune into that. But thanks again um, and take care, everyone.